Okay, thanks everybody for coming this afternoon. I'd like to introduce um, a colleague and a very good friend as well, Professor Solomon Oforiakwa. So Solomon is holding a joint appointment at the University Sorry, is so it me or did we? Hello? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you now. You're, 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 we can hear you, but you're going in and out. Yeah, it's not a very. Um... Yeah, so Solomon is, is holding a joint appointment at the University of Pittsburgh and University of Ghana. And at the University of Ghana, he's Dean of the School of Biomedical and Allied Health Sciences, and also the Director of um, the West African Genetic Medicine Center, WAGMIC. Um, Solomon is also the PI for Sickle Gen Africa, and he's a hematology scientist, so to speak, with a strong focus on sickle cell disease research and also um, genomic research. So Solomon, thank you for coming this afternoon. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kofi. Can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. All right. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to join you virtually. And uh, I must acknowledge, uh, I see Mark um, Mark Layton, uh, as part of the audience, and some of you may not know that Mark was my PhD supervisor, and so Mark can take credit for all the good things I say today and also all the bad things that I say. Um, I'm going to talk to you about sickle gen Africa, clinical implications of hemoprexin deficiency uh, in sickle cell disease. But if you permit me, I, I want to share my first slide, uh, really to remember a colleague, uh, Paul Frenette, uh, who passed away sadly uh, July of this year. Paul was a, a giant in the field of uh, sickle cell research and stem cell research. Uh, I, I suspect some of you uh, know of this cartoon to my right, which is showing the adhesion of sickle erythrocytes in a cartoon form uh, caught up in a vasculature. And this is actually the work of a review that Paul authored uh, with another colleague. So I want to, with your permission, dedicate uh, this keynote address or lecture uh, to the memory of Paul Frenet. Uh, may his soul uh, rest in perfect peace. So let me start with uh, this slide, which highlights some key landmarks in sickle cell disease in the context of the genomic revolution. Uh, the sickle cell uh, DNA was sequenced in 1977. This is around the same time that Frederick Sanger and um, Alan Maxim Gilbert came up with a technique to sequence DNA. This is when Marota sequenced the sickle cell uh, cDNA. Actually, it was a cDNA that was um, prepared from, or rather transcribed from reticulocyte mRNA. Uh, and this was also a landmark in our study of genomics. The Globin switching meeting started in 78. The discovery of RFLPs, restriction of fragment length polymorphisms, in 78. Uh, the sickle haplotypes we've heard a lot about uh, really uh, were auditioned in 1984. And then between 1990 and 2003, we had the Human Genome Project, uh, which paved the way for a lot of the work that we are currently doing in the field of genomics. Discovery of BC11A quantitative trade locus, our own Swilly thing at that time, I think at Oxford, that was in 2007. Now, a lot of genomic work was being done. It became clear that a lot of the genomes that were being studied really lacked diversity. These are mainly the genomes of Europeans, uh, largely. And so NIH and Wellcome came up with the idea of H3Africa, in 2012. Uh, and then I just want to show you CRISPR here. 
2017. And then SQLgen was the second part uh, when H3 Africa had phase two, we joined uh, and proposed this study that I'm going to talk to you about called SQLgen Africa, which to date is the largest cohort study uh, of sickle cell disease in the world. Around the same time, um, the multicentric origin of the sickle mutation was shattered by nice work done by uh, Rutimi and his colleagues uh, that showed that in fact the sickle cell mutation occurred just once uh, in one individual. So what I'm going to do uh, is capture my, my talks uh, around some of these landmarks. I'm showing you the world map, and typically I show this in most of my talks, just to align people to the fact that what you're seeing here uh, is the piece of land that individual countries call their own. And basically, uh, you know, so this piece of space here is Nigeria. Uh, you guys are over there in London. So the key to this map is land mass. There is a software called World Mapper that you can use to redraw the world map in whatever form you want once you feed it the parameter that you are interested in. So I've told you this is land mass. If you feed the world mapper under five mortality, this is the five, this is the, the global map of under five mortality. You can see that England has basically shrinked uh, and Africa and India have ballooned uh, because in terms of the world, these are parts of the regions of the world where under five mortality uh, is a perennial developmental health challenge. So if we do the same for sickle cell disease, you see that the epicenter of the disease uh, is in Africa and India. Uh, this is a big, big problem uh, in this part of the world. Uh, these are the estimates for 2010, uh, the estimates for 2050 when Nigeria becomes the third largest country in terms of population, either the third or the fifth. I always get it confused. Uh, becomes the third or the fifth largest country in the world. We will still have large numbers of individuals or babies born with sickle cell anemia. In fact, this slide is only showing with sickle cell anemia, so that is homozygous SS, not showing for SC or S beta thalassemia. So sickle cell then is a major problem in this part of the world uh, where we think it contributes to the high under five mortality that I showed you uh, in my previous slide. We don't know the exact proportion of under five mortality uh, due to sickle cell disease in this part of the world. But there are no, there are no, no, born, new, no newborn screening programs in this part of the world, so we don't really know. So the challenge is that the proportion of the five mortality in sickle cell caused by uh, under five mortality caused by sickle cell disease uh, is unknown. Uh, the problem with sickle cell disease is huge. For this audience, uh, I probably don't have to go through this slide, but I'll just do a quick job of uh, showing just one slide to narrate the molecular genetics, the pathogenesis, complications, treatment, and survival of sickle cell disease. We know that the genetic problem is on the short arm of chromosome 11. Uh, where the beta globin locus uh, sits and the beta globin locus has multiple genes that are expressed in a developmental manner in the order in which they are arranged, uh, five prime to three prime. So sickle cell disease is a single point mutation in the adult beta globin gene where an A is changed to a T. Uh, this leads to the substitution of glutamine, uh, glutamic acid rather, for valine at position six. That is sufficient for the beta S polypeptide and the low oxygen tension for that hemoglobin to polymerize and leads to um, you know, changes in the structure and the shape of the, of the red cell. So what you see here are sickle cells. Uh, and then this is what I showed you earlier, Paul Frenet's uh, very nice design of uh, visocclusion. Uh, what that means is that when this happens, blood flow to the organs downstream of the occlusion uh, is stopped, so tissues get starved. The red cell in sickle cell patients also has a propensity to lives uh, very readily. Uh, so the average uh, lifespan of a red cell is 120 days, as most of you know, uh, for sickle cell anywhere 20 days. So these cellular abnormalities of increased hemolysis and increased propensity to adhere 
uh, to the endothelium and to other cells, uh, we believe uh, promotes a myriad of clinical complications in virtually all organ systems, from the brain all the way to the skin. Uh, this primary cellular anomaly of cells sticking together or cells breaking up in a long controlled fashion causes these diseases. Currently, there are four drugs that are approved by the US FDA for sickle cell disease. Uh, and I'm sorry to say none of these really target the primary part of physiology of the disease, but these are the drugs that we have. In the United States, uh, the median survival of individual sickle cell disease is markedly lower compared to individuals who don't have sickle cell disease and come from the same neighborhood. And so this essentially uh, is, is a very brief snapshot of the molecular genetics, the pathogenesis, complications, treatment, and survival of sickle cell disease. In our part of the world where I'm speaking to you from in Ghana, uh, the problem is actually very, very basic. Uh, just diagnosis. There are lots of children in fact, there is no newborn screening program. And so you find that there are kids walking around who have sickle cell disease and their parents don't know it. And what I'm sharing with you is the work that we actually did with Kofi uh, two years ago. Uh, the guy to the left holding a, a sword is one of the major chiefs in Ghana who was celebrating his 20th anniversary. Uh, he asked us to tag along to provide free medical screen to his population and we included in that a sickle cell screen. And as you can see uh, in this table, uh, we screened 418 children for, for sickle cell disease. We found five kids who were homozygous for sickle cell disease and nobody had diagnosed them. They didn't know they had sickle cell disease. Not uh, importantly, not did their parents. Eight had SC disease. So diagnosis is a very, major problem. Uh, in fact, in this study that we did, the prevalence was 3.1%, which is pretty high. Uh, and so in this part of the world, uh, just diagnosing kids with sickle cell disease is a major problem. Uh, I know that is not a problem in England. Uh, newborn screening is not a problem. Uh, and, and the five mortality in England due to sickle cell disease, as this slide is showing here for the United States, uh, over the years, the last 30 years, uh, 79 to 2009, that the crude mortality in children has dropped significantly uh, because now we know that prophylaxis with penicillin can block, stop basically kids from having infection. But if you cast your eye to the older uh, uh, patients, the adults, uh, it really hasn't changed. And that's because we still don't have an answer to the inevitable end organ damage that we all know our sickle cell patients are at risk of developing. We don't have an answer to that. Uh, we do have some ideas that intravascular hemolysis uh, through sterile inflammation plays a role uh, in basically causing both acute and chronic organ damage. Uh, this is a slide my boss Gladwin and I did uh, for a review in blood a few years ago. And the intravascular hemolysis and, and its role in vascular disease, we think that uh, excess hemoglobin, we all know scavengers nitric oxide, uh, and when that happens, you have smooth muscle uh, stasis, dystonia rather, uh, the smooth muscles are not able to relax. We think that contributes to uh, pulmonary hypertension. There is some evidence that cell free hemoglobin also causes kidney injury. Uh, in the absence of haptoglobin, excess hemoglobin uh, really becomes oxidized. The heme loss leads to heme being uh, in excess in the intravascular space. Uh, most of the work I've done in my lab is trying to understand the clinical uh, implications of free heme. Uh, we know that it can, uh, unchecked, lead to tissue damage and cause acute lung injury in a mouse model. Uh, we know excess iron is also bad. So the intravascular hemolysis then uh, can release these uh, molecules we call DAMPs, danger associated molecular pattern molecules that can cause a variety uh, of in, or rather injury in basically a lot of tissues. So that then became a focus for Sickle Gen Africa. Sickle Gen Africa basically came up with the, uh, our scientific premise is that the danger molecules released by uh, hemolysis promote sterile inflammation in sickle cell disease. This is what we are thinking of. 
that excess heme, excess cell-free hemoglobin uh, through TLR4 signaling, and we demonstrated this in a mouse model uh, in our publication in the JCI, uh, now coming up to 10 years ago, that this is a pathway that can cause acute lung injury. Uh, we now have some data that it can also cause acute kidney injury. Unpublished data suggests it can also trigger cerebral infarct uh, in experimental mouse models of sickle cell disease. We know that the rapidly progressive acute chest syndrome in people, uh, this experimental model we have mirrors that. And the idea then is that this pathway uh, causes uh, a lot of tissue injury in the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and in the renal system. So sickle in Africa, this is our main scientific focus. Uh, the question is, can we get answers to this? But let me just digress for a second. With respect to the acute lung injury, uh, we've now done a reasonable body of work to demonstrate that infusion hemopexin uh, and a recombinant uh, hemoxygenase 1 uh, that is now being developed uh, by pharma can potentially uh, thwart the deleterious effect of cell free hemoglobin uh, in the lung. So we know that this is one pathway that there are, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies are exploring hemoxygenase 1 as a, an infusion and also recombinant HO1 as a therapeutic uh, to stop this part of the, of, the, of the hemolysis. But we know that we have innate mechanisms to fight this. Uh, there's a hemolysis defense mechanism uh, that we know can happen, and this is through haptoglobin, hemopexin, alpha-1 microglobulin, hemoxygenase 1, and ferritin. Uh, and so in circles in Africa, really we put together a huge group of people to come together to try and understand the genetics of these cytoprotective proteins. And briefly, just to talk you through the organization of the network, um, the home, the hub is in Accra, where we have the administrative core and also project one that I lead. Let me just jump to Pittsburgh, uh, where Kofi mentioned I have a joint appointment. Uh, the bioinformatics for all of this will be done by colleagues in Pittsburgh. Project two is based in Tanzania. Uh, when I say it's based in Tanzania, just the leadership, the work is being done in all the collaborative sites that you see, uh, but somebody has to lead it. And so uh, initially, project two was being led uh, by Julie McCartney from DA. Uh, project three is an echocardiovascular project uh, where we are basically echoing. Uh, we've actually now reached a thousand. A thousand sickle cell patients was echoed in Kano. Uh, just uh, this week, actually. Uh, and then we are collaborating with our colleagues in South Africa in H3 Bionet uh, to help with the bioinformatics. So this is uh, the organizational structure, if you like, uh, of the of the network uh, involving uh, now up to about 50 investigators. Our overall hypothesis is that genetic variation influences the body's defense against hemolysis and it's associated sequela on organ function and sickle cell disease. And we want to find the, the SNPs uh, that are involved in that. Uh, the, you know, the, the, this, what I've just explained to you uh, was recently published, I guess, last year, last year uh, in, in the Lancet Global Health. So if you want to read more about uh, sickle gene Africa, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do so. What is the design of the study? Uh, I'm going to walk you through this as carefully as I can. Uh, this is uh, overall a prospective cross-sectional observational study of the role of genetics uh, of hemolysis cytoprotic proteins in organ damage. Uh, and basically, we follow this arrow. Uh, we started with developing uh, a, a common study protocol um, and then uh, got that study protocol initially approved in the site in Ghana, the hub. And I will share that with our collaborative sites uh, in, in uh, Nigeria and Tanzania, and they got it approved. Uh, then we had training uh, in the use of REDCAP for all site uh, investigators and staff. Uh, we did a community engagement uh, as the first step, uh, engaging the community before taking a blood sample, and Kofi led those studies. So, in fact, the community engagement was done again in all six. Uh, cities, Accra, Kumasi, Ghana. 
three cities in Nigeria, and then one in Dar es Salaam. Uh, and then we began the patient recruitment. Uh, we've actually now recruited all 7,000 patients that we wanted to recruit. Uh, basically, uh, the recruitment is a steady state or during acute illness. Uh, we go through this process of uh, disease verification, uh, really using uh, capillary electrophoresis uh, to do the hemoglobin electrophoresis. Uh, we are somewhere here right now. We've done our second stint of community engagement. In fact, Kofi and I were in uh, Lagos only a few, a few, maybe just last month, I guess, uh, continuing with the engagement of the community that we are studying, uh, even after we've collected the samples, uh, you know, several years prior. We are now at this stage where we are analyzing data for uh, some of the um, parameters that we have completed uh, and then still performing additional biochemical uh, studies. Uh, the results are being analyzed uh, again uh, in collaboration with the, the, the collaborative sites uh, as well as uh, guidance from H3 Africa and feedback information that we're getting from uh, our community engagement processes. I just want to show you some pictures of the community engagement we did the very first time. So this is now going back uh, close to three years now. Uh, in, uh, this was in Accra, we did in Kumasi, Abuja. Uh, and it's important to note that the, in doing the community engagement, we, uh, we had a 20, you know, 20 participants uh, that represented parents, patients, um, policy, policy makers. So we got folks from the ministries of health. We got physicians, nurses. We got traditional leaders uh, because in this part of the world, a lot of patients, um, regardless of age, uh, really look to their uh, uh, traditional leaders for their approval uh, to participate in studies. The community engagement work, uh, I'm pleased to say, with Kofi's leadership was published recently in BMJ Open, uh, where we talked about uh, some of the qualitative uh, aspects of the work and people's ideas and their impressions uh, about uh, autonomy, uh, best interests of genomics, their, their perspective about these samples that we are taking and storing them uh, for years. Uh, whether they are happy for us to share sample and data uh, with investigators outside CircleGen. Uh, and this, this really uh, has been uh, very good uh, and shape and guide how we handle uh, the information that patients uh, have given us, uh, you know, through consent. I just want to digress just a little bit. Uh, you know the community engagement and the and the ethics part of this work uh, in Circle in Africa has also helped uh, spur additional activities. And what I'm sharing with you is a short course in genetic education and counseling for sickle disease uh, that we held uh, in June. Uh, it was very very uh, helpful. It was really uh, partly because of this engagement stuff that we've been doing with patients, uh, recognizing the need and stakeholders the need for this sort of short course uh, to help uh, individuals really speak to sickle cell disease to patients uh, with you know better competency than they are. I really want to uh, again thank Kofis for his leadership in this area. Uh, we had a very good um, diversity of faculty, uh, clinical psychologists, uh, medical geneticists, hematologists, laboratory people. Uh, in the end, uh, when we asked the participants about the extent to which the short course helped them, uh, you can see uh, that it was either very good or excellent and how they read the course content. We were very happy with it. Uh, we graduated uh, 10 um, basically participants. These are all healthcare workers, either they are nurses, uh, pharmacists, uh, but uh, invariably come in contact with sickle cell patients and this short course in genetic education and counseling in sickle cell disease was a two week online, actually one week online, I forget what it was, one or two week, also online course, 40 hours at least, uh, helped them uh, to now 
be able to speak to sickle cell disease uh, with much more confidence than they were before. On the back of that, we've now developed a master's program in genetic counseling, uh, which is going to start in January. And we have seven uh, students that will have enrolled uh, to start this new MSc in genetic counseling, uh, which will be the very first of its kind in sub-Sahara Africa. So again, leveraging the community engagement work in sickle in Africa uh, and talking to stakeholders, uh, that really has helped us to develop a, a new educational program that will move forward some of the work that we have been doing in that space. So let's come back to sickle in Africa. Uh, I mentioned to you that we've actually reached our target of 7,000 uh, patients we wanted to enroll. Uh, we have this as this is, oh, we're still in November. Okay, so as of this month, uh, enrolled 3,910 children and 3,108 adults. Uh, you can see the cities where uh, these patients are enrolled, Accra, Abuja, Dar es Salaam, Kumasi, uh, for the children and the adults, uh, Accra, uh, where I am, we have the largest number. Uh, collectively, this is 7,000 patients enrolled in a sickle cell project, uh, by far the largest uh, of such study in the world. The, the next largest study is the cooperative study of sickle cell disease that I believe enrolled 3,500. So we have hit the mark in terms of the number of patients. In terms of the uh, results, uh, it's very important about you know what results we can give back uh, as a as a network. We've decided to give back at least one result, and that is the uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis results uh, that we have on, on these participants. And this slide really uh, illustrates the importance of doing that. Um, you know, this is analysis of the first 1,062 patients uh, who self, this is the, the, uh, on the case report form, we asked them what type of sickle cell disease they have. Uh, and so the and you can see in this slide that really there were just three types of sickle cell disease that the patients identify themselves as having. And then we analyze samples from the same uh, 1062, and you can see that we found uh, a lot more type, different types of sickle cell disease or hemoglobin type than the patients said they had. Overall, you know, 27 patients uh, thought they had one type of sickle cell disease, and in fact, they had a different type. So this has informed us to share this result with the patients, partly because uh, it costs money to do this sort of thing in this part of the world. And a lot of patients don't have the funds to do it. And so you can have a sickle cell patient who been attending clinics for years and has never really had electrophoresis done because they don't have the funds to do it. So we thought that uh, we were duty bound uh, to share the results of the hemoglobin electrophoresis with our patients, and we've done so. With respect to the research projects, I just want to uh, speak very briefly about Project 3 and Project 1. Uh, project 3, I'm just showing you just one slide. This is a little old. Um, I just mentioned, I told you that we've done a thousand echoes. This data is for 826. Uh, the echoes uh, been done in Kano, and we'll start doing the echoes in Accra. Uh, and you can see the data. This is really not surprising. Uh, the TI jet velocity uh, that, you know, 4.2% of TI velocity over three. Uh, and now we're going to do a thousand in Accra. Uh, and then um, the point of project three is to interrogate the, the genotyping data that we're going to uh, accumulate from from uh, the H3 Africa array and ask whether there is any relationship uh, between SNPs that influence uh, the level of the cytoprotective proteins and any of these echocardiovascular phenotyping. So the first part was to do the echoes. We've done the echoes. Uh, the genotypings uh, are yet to be done. Uh, the phenotyping of the cytoprotective proteins are still ongoing. Uh, once we've gotten all this data together, then we'll be basically interrogating them uh, to find genetic markers uh, for TR jet velocity, uh, for instance. 
So now let me turn to the, the latter part of this talk, which is uh, the hemopexin. Uh, so here is the data for 2,259. Uh, you can see hemopexin uh, is here. Um, now, normal range for hemopexin uh, really is around here. It's actually, this has moved a little bit. It's actually 0.5 to 1. Uh, majority of sickle cell patients uh, are basically have very low hemopexin, very, very low. But you can see that is a range. You know, uh, some sickle cell patients have really basically zero. Others have 1.2. Uh, why is that? Um, the hemopexin is the primary scavenger of him. There is a secondary uh, scavenger of him uh, known as alpha-1 microglobulin. Uh, the normal range of alpha-1 microglobulin is around here. So you can see in sickle cell patients, there's this compensatory increase in the concentration of alpha-1 microglobulin. This got us thinking that um, this potentially uh, could be interesting to look at uh, because alpha-1 microglobulin binds him and takes it to the kidney, whereas hemopexin binds him and takes it uh, to, the, to the liver. Uh, so the question was whether or not there's any relationship between uh, the hemopexin or M1 hemopexin ratio and markers of kidney of kidney injury. Uh, the first thing we did was just for hemolysis, and you can see that there's a, a nice correlation between M1 hemopexin ratio and plasma hemoglobin, as well as LDH. Then we looked at ki kidney injury marker 1, KIM1, and NGAL, both uh, injury markers of kidney, and uh, surprisingly, we found that there's a correlation between the proportion of M1 hemopexin and these kidney injury markers. We asked whether this was true of the transgenic sickle cell mouse, and you can see this is the sickle cell mouse. The M1 hemopexin ratio is markedly higher in the SS mouse compared to uh, the AA mouse. Uh, and again, not surprisingly, uh, the M M1 was high in these in these mice. Uh, and so we wanted to test the hypothesis that if there is an excess of him, given the uh, basically the, the, the observation that sickle cell patients and mice have very low level of hemopexin but high M1. If you increase the HEM, will the HEM, excess HEM go to the kidney or go to the liver? So this is the data. Well, we are measuring total HEM, uh, I believe 48 hours after challenging this mouse with a, a very small dose of HEM. So this is the AA mouse, and you can see so that V is vehicle, H is him. And so you can see for the AA mouse uh, in the kidney, really there was no change, nothing happened in the kidney. But for the SS mouse, uh, a lot of the him infused here ended up in the kidney. Once, when we looked in the liver, we saw the opposite. So in the liver, uh, the, the normal mouse had an increase of him in the liver, as you would expect, because hemopexin is supposed to bind the him and take it to the liver. Surprisingly, in the sickle cell mouse, there was no increase in the liver whatsoever, even though this mouse had been challenged with him. So this showed us that in the event of an acute intravascular hemolysis, where is there an acute elevation in circulating him? In sickle cell patients, majority of that excess him will be taken to the kidney uh, because of this increase in uh, M1. We then asked whether that impacted kidney function by doing GFR analysis, whether the exclusion kinetics of FITC labeled sinistrine uh, is really used. And we you basically uh, monitor that uh, with, the, with the device at the back. And so we're looking at relative fluorescence uh, for AA mouse at baseline and following him and, you know, in agreement with the physiological data I showed you earlier, no change in the GFR. Do the same thing in a sickle mouse and the glomer filtration rate after 48 hours of him injection basically uh, is reduced. So there's acute injury to the kidney as a result of that infusion with him. And so the GFR uh, ratio in a sickle cell mouse following the him challenge uh, the kidney is acutely damaged. Then this is the histological evidence 
uh, of damage in both the cortex and the medulla of the SS mouse uh, compared to the AA mouse. So clearly, an acute elevation of him uh, in which the excess him is taken to the kidney instead of the uh, liver causes acute damage uh, in the sickle cell mouse. We're looking at Prussian blue stain in here, uh, showing you excess deposition of iron uh, in the uh, kidney of the excess, but not of the AA mouse. The question was whether this was really due to uh, the genetics, and so we repeated experiments with a hemopexin knockout, uh, hemopexin wild type mouse, a hemopexin knockout mouse, uh, and we showed that in the absence of sickle cell disease, a hemopexin knockout mouse behaved exactly like a sickle cell mouse. And so this was not uh, due to anything else other than the acquired deficiency of hemopexin in a sickle cell mouse that was putting the sickle cell mouse at risk of acute kidney injury in the event of an acute hemolytic episode. Uh, we've looked at the sickle gen data, uh, looking at the hemopexin and the alpha-1 microglobulin uh, in SS and SC. And it's interesting to note that in SC patients, uh, the hemopexin deficiency is relatively moderate, not as severe as it is in sickle cell disease. This leads to a hemopexin M1 ratio in SC that is um, not as bad as in sickle cell disease. Uh, and as you know, some of you guys know, uh, clinicians who look at the sickle cell patients, that SC patients uh, really don't have such a high risk for, for kidney disease, uh, whereas SS do have. And we think this is partly because of the uh, basically enhanced clearance of excess heme through the kidneys instead of the liver uh, in sickle cell patients. Uh, we actually published this uh, in blood last year uh, where we identified hemopexin deficiency uh, as really a risk factor for the development of acute kidney injury in sickle cell disease. Uh, this work was done uh, partly because we had the very nice data in the sickle gen cohort uh, that informed us to then do the mechanistic studies uh, in, in, in the mice. Uh, and so the summary of that paper was that in the event of an excess heme in AA mice, most of the heme goes to the liver through hemopexin, very little goes to the kidney. In fact, the data I showed you in the mice, there was no increase in kidney uh, heme after we challenged the AA mouse. Whereas for the SS mouse, uh, most of that heme goes to the kidney, uh, causing ALI. So, uh, so the study so far, uh, I'll uh, something is uh, with with um, there's somebody some background noise there. Let me just uh, finish with this last slide. Uh, now we have enrolled 7,000 patients, um, which again makes it a very live study, and we are still in the midst of uh, conducting the um, uh, the patients surprisingly are very eager to participate in genomics research. Uh, despite uh, apprehensions about the healthcare system. The healthcare system in Nigeria, Ghana, and Tanzania is not, is not the best. Uh, and yet we're surprised uh, how eager patients are uh, to participate in, in, in research. In fact, one of the most surprising thing we found was the, uh, the proportion of patients who gave broad consent for their data and sample to be shared with other investigators. I think over 95% of patients said uh, they're perfectly okay with their data and their sample being shared with investigators uh, researching other diseases, not even focused on blood. And then we've, through this work, shown very nicely in a mouse model that acquired deficiency of hemopexin and sickle cell disease uh, causes a maladaptive elevation of alpha 1 microglobulin that promotes the delivery of excess heme to the kidneys instead of to the liver. And I know that this is informing some of the clinical decisions my colleagues in Pittsburgh are making when sickle cell patients present uh, to the ER with acute hemolysis. Uh, I want to end on that slide and thank you uh, for the opportunity to share some of our work uh, with you. We believe that Sickle Gen Africa uh, now uh, is providing a platform, uh, as I showed you, for even training in, in genetic counseling. Uh, the samples that we have, uh, we uh, we share them uh, freely through H3 Africa. 
uh, to answer questions that are still plaguing this disease. And uh, I look forward uh, to an opportunity to work with some of you guys uh, in, in, in London. I, I train in London, so I still have my uh, biases towards London. Uh, it will be nice to connect and see how we can uh, collaboratively uh, mine some of the data that we're collecting. So on that note, uh, I thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Solomon, for that uh, tour de force and uh, sh sharing the phenomenal work of the Sickle Gen Africa project. I think uh, it's it's a really exemplary uh, uh, study uh, that we could all learn a great deal from. Um, if if you're if you're happy to uh, take a few questions, I'm sure there there will be from um, those here. Um, this question yeah. from uh, Asad Lukmani. Yeah, th thank you very much, Professor Solomon. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, a question I have about the renal um, effects that you were talking about of the hemopexin deficiency and um, relative disruption in the ratio. Uh, I mean, we, we know that the renal um, effects in sickle cell are multifactorial and probably vasoocclusion plays some part as well. Um, so. How in your sickle cell mice did you control for the effect of laser occlusion having an uh, effect on the kidney function as well? Great question. So I, I said the you know uh, in the the injury uh, can be uh, multifactorial, especially the chronic injury. Uh, but the way we controlled for this, uh, we actually were studying the same mouse, uh, and so for instance the GFR. Uh, that we did in the mouse is the same mouse uh, that we basically are doing the GFR uh, and then challenging the mouse uh, and then going back two days later to do the GFR. Uh, so then in the interim, uh, if there was a vasoclusive event uh, in the mouse that contributed, uh, we wouldn't know. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the difficulty things, uh, difficulties with, with mice, <laughs> they don't tell you when they are in pain, right? So uh, it's it's very difficult. Uh, to really um, account for that. Uh, so there could have been uh, additional events uh, that contributed to the uh, you know, deterioration in GFR within the two day period that we challenged and then and then uh, we didn't. Uh, but we got exactly the same results in a hemoplexin knockout mouse, uh, which doesn't have sickle cell disease and will not uh, have visual occlusion. Uh, and so I guess uh, that makes it fairly confident. Uh, the phenomenon we're seeing was really due to deficiency of hemopexin in the face of an acute elevation in him. Thank you. Solomon, could, could I ask, ask you that there are obviously a number of um, uh, novel therapies that, that have been developed or in, in development that are, are targeted at intravascular hemolysis and, and thinking, thinking specifically about voxelator. Um, what impact do you think that might might have on on um, uh, heme related uh, ren renal injury? So I think the 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 drugs that are currently being developed, um, especially G the GBT one, is really sort of uh, looking at the chronic effects, right? And so the heme release, we have to think of the heme release. Uh, in terms of the injury it causes acutely and the injury that it causes cumulatively over time. Uh, and so with respect to something like hemoplexin infusion, uh, you can think of hemoplexin infusion as something you use in the acute setting, um, whereas, uh, you know, the resolatol effects will not really be acute in terms of uh, sequestering the effect of an uh, heme that has been released uh, excessively. So I see the infusion therapeutics really as uh, acute, acute phase therapeutics to stop, uh, you know, acute tissue damage as we have shown uh, with the AKI model and also with the ALI model. Uh, whereas uh, the medications that are currently being developed, I see them as really, uh, you know, stopping long term effects uh, of, of, you know, chronic chronic uh, intravascular hemolysis, uh, visual occlusion, chronic hypoxia. Uh, that's how I see 
uh, the two sort of the, the two therapeutics. One where you can basically uh, use acutely to stop uh, bad effects, and one that uh, you know build the uh, the capacity uh, of the person to to deal with it uh, in a long term long term fashion. Thank, thanks. And this question from uh, Mercy Ibidapo. Well, um, thank you very much for a very illuminating lecture. I've really learned a lot from it. Uh, my question relates to uh, patients that um, uh, in whom you do an echocardiogram and you find the TRV above uh, um, maybe 29 centimeters per second. Um, is there any plan to advance the investigation? We know that um, uh, uh, TRV or PASP is probably just about a third of the patients are, are picked up on um, echocardio. I mean, the sensitivity is about um, about 30 percent. Um, do you have facilities to measure the like the atrial natriuretic uh, factor, or proceed to right um, heart catheterization? And um, that's that's the first one. And there are there uh, criteria to start these patients on some form of disease modifying uh, treatment? Yes. So the thank you for the question. Um, so the the first part of that study we've done in Cano, uh, led by uh, cardiologists. So that project three in our network is really just all being done by cardiologists. Uh, we are. Uh, just uh, there as, as support staff. In terms of, let me take it backwards, in terms of therapeutics, um, I think once the patient has been identified to have, uh, you know, high TIG velocity and a potential risk, uh, then this is where, again, the cost becomes an issue uh, because I'm sure the patient will be sat down, they will tell the patient what therapeutic options there are. Uh, but uh, money usually becomes the the, the rate limiting factor uh, in some of these, uh, you know, high end treatments. And so that uh, will be my uh, the, the therapeutics are here. The question is whether uh, the patients will be in a position uh, to basically afford it. In terms of biomarkers, uh, like you know uh, uh, that you mentioned, we haven't really planned to look for additional biomarkers other than the echo. Uh, and so again, this is where we'll be open to collaborative work. Uh, we are storing uh, samples and serum of this patient. So, you know, if one comes up with a study to look at uh, additional biomarkers in plasma to correlate with the echo findings, we'll be open uh, for that sort of collaboration. Currently for uh, Circle Gen Africa, the scope of the study uh, is to basically collect the echo data uh, and then interrogate the echo data with the the, uh, the genotyping on the H3 Africa array, uh, which we are yet to do. Uh, I think I've answered two. There were three questions. Which was what was what was the third one? Uh, what are you? Uh, well, I think you've covered uh, um, all of my questions actually, because in terms of okay. the treatment, you, they, I mean, the patient cannot afford it, but. Even something like hydroxycarbamide can be a, a, a disease modifier, which I'm not sure whether there's any room for the patients to be treated with this or they have to pay for it as well. They have to pay for it. Uh, there is actually a very good program uh, that was piloted by Novartis uh, in collaboration with the Sickle Cell Foundation of Ghana and the government of Ghana. Uh, and so in Ghana currently there's a program uh, uh, hydroxyurea, uh, you guys call it hydroxycarbamide. Mm. <laughs> Americans call it hydroxyurea, yeah. US, I call it hydroxyurea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where hydroxyurea uh, is given freely to sickle cell patients in a project that Novartis uh, has piloted. The plan is that uh, they are going to tie the hands of the government that once hydroxyurea is offered freely for five years, the government will have no choice but to add it to the drugs, uh, the list of drugs uh, for the health insurance. I don't know what the situation is in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there, if there are no more questions, I, I, I'd just like to, to ask, ask um, Solon about the, the unicentric origin of the sickle mutation. Uh, which <laughs> yes 
which is a subject dear, dear to our hearts. And uh, um, obvi obviously there's some very important genetic uh, determinants linked to the sickle mutation that, that, that influence clinical uh, phenotype and, and severity. Is it, is it just happenstance or chance that, that the mutation has been linked to uh, variation fetal haemoglobin or, or might there be some it's a biological explanation for the the linkage of the sickle gene with a high F determinant in terms of protection or, or some other mechanism. Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, that's a great question, Mark. And you know, the unicentric origin uh, does, did not uh, basically dispel the um, the idea of the various haplotypes, right? The haplotypes are still there. Uh, and they have their uh, unique uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism patterns, except that what, um, you know, what Charles Rutimi and his group did with basically uh, next-gen sequencing was to align all those haplotypes to an older ancestral chromosome. And so all the haplotypes basically sort of diverged uh, from an ancestral uh, chromosome on which the sickle mutation uh, occurred. So the Benin haplotype is still there, you know, Cameroon haplotypes, but if you trace their origin, you, you can explain uh, that they all essentially uh, diverged uh, from an ancestral chromosome. With respect to the link between the sickle cell mutation and, you know, high determinants uh, of F, uh, I guess the answer is that um, I, I think the environment plays an important, when I say environment, the location, right? Um, you know, we have some work that we're doing currently that I can't speak too much about, about uh, the protection that individual sickle cell patients, uh, in individual sickle cell disease have with respect to malaria. Uh, and we've tried to, uh, you know, there have been several theories about 